call this meeting of the House Environment and Natural Resources Policy Committee to order. Uh, members, please take your seats. We do have a quorum. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from March 10th? So moved. Uh, Representative Acom moves the minutes of March 10th. Uh, any discussion to the minutes? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. And uh, Chair Purcell, we, first up we have House File 4254. Uh, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, good morning, members. Uh, yes, I'd like to move uh, House File 4254 uh, to uh, be referred to Environment and Natural Resource Finance. All right, Chair Purcell, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, this bill is, is uh, we all hear about simple bills. Well, this is uh, this is intended to be a simple bill. Um, some days that's that's harder to discern than others. Uh, but this this would uh, establish uh, uh, a DNR. Uh, project program uh, uh, to come up with uh, recommendations for watercraft operator safety program um, for boats uh, 16 feet and larger uh, in length. And uh, the, the intent is to develop best practices to reduce conflicts with other water users and reduce ecological impacts uh, to the aquatic ecosystem and the terrestrial ecosystem, lake shores, etc., and uh, to prevent the spread of invasive species. Uh, so, with that said, uh, we've got. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to walk through the bill unless anybody uh, uh, wants to. But I'm I'm going to have uh, uh, DNR folks that are going to they're going to assist me in in. Uh, Talking about this uh, this bill and the um, outcomes that we're that we're looking for with the uh, watercraft operator uh, safety program for watercraft operation. So, uh, uh, overview, Madam Chair. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Forrester, if you want to state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, my name is Jeff Forrester and I'm executive director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Um, thank you for uh, having uh, me here and thank you to Representative Purcell for carrying this bill forward. You know, one of the things, we have members all across the state and one of the things that I'm hearing um, is that boating is changing in Minnesota. The boats are bigger and faster and more complex and they have more impacts on lakes and other users. Minnesota has the most boats per capita of any state in the union. Um, so we're kind of a, a boating state. Uh, the problems that I'm seeing revolve around public safety, uh, user conflicts, and ecological impacts. Uh, there's a focus in this bill on wakeboard boats, which are very powerful boats that make large wakes for people to surf on behind. Um, the problem is, is the thrust with the boats can, you know, extend down into the water and churn up the bottom or, or impact aquatic habitat, uh, silt in spawning beds. Um, the wakes can damage shoreline property. Um, there's been some reported injuries uh, and, you know, wash away shoreline. Um, the other impact with this that uh, we've been talking about a lot lately is aquatic invasive species. Uh, a couple years ago, um, Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center did a study into the impacts uh, or, or the capacity of different boats to carry aquatic invasive species and more specifically where on the boats uh, AIS was most likely to be transported. Um, Adam Dahl from the DNR uh, worked on that study and came out with a paper on it. And I'd like to share a few things with you about this. Um, Mr. Forster, I'll just remind you, we have a very full agenda, okay. so if you stick, stick to the point, we would okay. all appreciate that. Um, what they found basically was uh, the ballast water tanks on wakeboard boats 
are um, the highest likelihood of carrying uh, zebra mussel villagers. The villagers survive longer in the ballast tanks than in other areas. Um, and uh, most people don't understand it. And, and it isn't well understood how to deal with the problem because it's hard to, you can't get all the water out usually. Um, so, and, and I'll share one story quickly. I have a, a, a woman that I know, a friend of ours, their family, um, worked on the Asian carp issue uh, extensively. So no stranger to aquatic invasive species. Saw her at a birthday party and she asked me what am I working on? And I said, oh, well, it seems like there's uh, some issues around wakeboard boats. And she said, what are they? And I said, well, zebra mussel villagers transporting AIS. And she said, what do you mean? And I explained it to her. And she got this sick look on her face and said, oh my God, we keep our boat year round in um, Minnetonka and we have a summer home up on Gull Lake and we pick the boat up and drop it in Gull Lake. Could we have been the ones that infested that lake. So to me, this points up the need for education. I think all of these problems deal with education. So this bill does two things. First, it asks the University of Minnesota and the uh, Fluid Dynamics Lab at St. Anthony uh, Falls to investigate the impacts of the boat motor thrusts and the wake uh, action of these boats. Um, and then uh, ask the DNR to convene interested parties to look at best management practices based on the best science. Um, that seems to be the key issue. When I looked on the industry website, there's a, a great quote in there that really hits home for me. It says, uh, the boats aren't the problem, it's the operators. And this really, you know, if, if people are educated, I think that they will do the right thing and um, kind of, uh, shift their ethic and we'll have a different, um, you know, we'll have fewer problems on the lakes. All right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list we have Jill Sims. And if you've signed up ahead of time, if you can be ready to go um, <laughs> when we're taking testimony, we'd appreciate it. Ms. Sims, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Jill Sims, and I represent the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide feedback on HF 4254. As the leading recreational boating trade association, the National Association, association of Marine Manu Ugh, the National Marine Manufacturers Association represents over 1,300 members nationwide and many brands that you know here in Minnesota, like Alumacraft, Lund, and Premier Pontoons. It is no surprise that the land of 10,000 lakes is number two for watercraft registration with over 825,000 registered watercraft or one boat for every six people. We fully support boater education as boating safety is a critical component of enjoying our state's precious water resources. However, this bill raises several concerns for the recreational boating industry. Number one, this bill does not address boater education for all operators. As written, this language is focused on watercraft only over 16 feet and enhanced wake watercraft, which is not a defined term within statute or within the marine industry. While well, it has been made clear in the press that this bill is directed towards wake boats, this is a misguided and convoluted effort. To put things in perspective, last year there were 5,200 boats under 23 feet sold compared to 550 wake boats or wake surfing boats. In fact, of the 825,000 registered watercraft in Minnesota, it is estimated that wake boats make up less than 1% of total registrations. It's also important to note that Minnesota DNR statistics show that non-fatal boating accidents have increased since 2010, and we believe that mandatory boater safety for all boaters is an effective way to help address this increase. Second, aquatic invasive species education is important and should be applied equally to all operators. While we support further and more aggressive AIS education, we strongly recommend that it's provided to all. Realistically, wake surfing boats are less likely to be towed from lake to lake due to their heavy nature compared to a light fishing boat. For example, a bass boat, which weighs around 2,000 pounds, can easily be towed from lake to lake with a typical family crossover. Third, consistent. We encourage boating safety operator education and requirements to be consistent with other recreational products. Additionally, we recommend the inclusion of the National Association of Boating Law Administrators, NASBLA, in the process. 
NASBLA is the leading nonprofit for recreational boating safety and offers course design and approval for states offering boater safety programs. States that require these safety programs typically offer a NASBLA approved or designed course for their operators. It's important for users and safety purposes that we keep these standards consistent. Finally, we think it's important that the DNR leads or manages any studies as they are the department focused on managing and protecting our water resources in Minnesota. This provides a neutral forum for inquiries and public input. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to express our concerns with this bill and look forward to working with stakeholders to establish a boater safety program that educates all boaters on best practices to enjoy the land of 10,000 lakes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience wishing to testify on this bill? Colonel Smith, please uh, introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. For the record, Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Madam Chair, members, um, we'd like to thank uh, Representative Chair Purcell for bringing this forward. Um, like Mr. Forrester did say, boating has changed in the state. We do have a watercraft operator safety program that has been in place for several decades. Um, and um, it's, the one, it's the only recreational vehicle or watercraft type safety education program that doesn't have a born on date or mandatory. So for ATV, snowmobile, firearm safety, for example, if you're born after a certain date, you're required to have some type of safety education program. Um, we're very interested in, in exploring that possibility in the future. Um, we do uh, have some concerns with um, singling out a potentially individual watercraft type. Um, I think this is a good opportunity and the department thinks it's a good opportunity to get interested parties from both sides of the issue at the table and talk about some solutions and some issues uh, in the interim and maybe come up with some things that we can bring forward next year that would uh, uh, be a, some type of compromise and really move things forward. We've been through this in, in um, a few years ago or a couple decades ago with personal watercraft when we had some issues with personal watercraft. Obviously, they're not the same, but the root is that you have a user conflict and it's on the water. And so um, I think the department and the legislature and interested parties back then worked really well together to find some common sense um, laws, but we also did a lot of education and outreach with those people that were operating those, those types of machines. And I think we've gotten to a place now in the state where we don't have that user conflict in personal watercraft. I think we can mirror that process with this and really look forward to uh, getting those folks together at the table and coming up with a good solution for next year. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else in the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right, we'll move on to discussion. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have a question for Colonel Smith. Um, there's quite a bit of discussion in the bill about uh, invasive species, but I'm wondering about with the power of these boats, and shallow lake bottoms and what the if we have a lake that has um, contaminants in the sediment uh, that are currently contained in that sediment and then you have a, a higher powered motor that stirs up the lake bottom and suspends those contaminants in the water uh, have you guys seen any evidence of that or anything in terms of aquatic vegetation destruction or I'm, I'm concerned about that particular component because we may have some lakes that have a greater amount of contaminants that are currently contained in in the sediment. Colonel Smith. Madam Chair, Representative Hansen. So there has been some research out there and I don't know if it's been peer reviewed and that's one of the reasons we'd also like to take some time in the interim to uh, have the DNR make their decisions best on based on the best science available and something that has been peer reviewed. And so um, that's definitely a concern. Um, we have talked with our fisheries folks and ecological and water resources folks and, you know, they're just starting to get their arms around this. And so this will give us an opportunity to look for that best science if we have to do it on our own, but, um, and, and consider those issues because it is a concern for the department. All right, uh, Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colonel Smith and uh, Chair Parcell, is it safe to say that this bill is a work in progress and education is the best tool we have to combat these issues? Chair Purcell. Reverend Heinzman, yes. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Uh, any members, any further discussion? Uh, with that, uh, Chair Purcell, uh, any closing comments? Just appreciate the conversation and uh, we look forward to making this happen here. All right. Uh, Chair Purcell renews his motion that House File 4254 be referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources Finance. All those, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, let's see. Next up on the agenda, uh, Chair Purcell, you're not going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, House File 4058, uh, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I would move House File 4058, uh, to be, uh, recommend to pass and move to Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Division. All right, and I see there's an author's amendment, the A2 amendment. Would you like to move your amendment to put the bill in the form you would like? Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I move the A2 amendment. Actually, I'm taking a look at this. It actually, double checking with research, but it looks like it's the A20-0699 amendment. I think Madam Chair, I think it's a 0-0. A20-0699. Okay. All right. Got to get those numbers right. Uh, all right. Uh, any discussion to the A20-0699 amendment? All right. All those in favor of that <coughs> amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, motion carries, uh, Representative Purcell, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, this is uh, the MPCA policy bill, and um, there are a number of, uh, of uh, measures that uh, MPCA is, uh, is advancing here, and, and I have with me... Uh, Assistant Commissioner Kirk Kadelka to uh, walk us through the bill. All right, Assistant Commissioner Kadelka, if you could uh, introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And as our author uh, mentioned, there are three provisions in here, all in the lands area, which is the area I work in. And so I'll, I'll work off the delete all amendment and go through them in in order. And here, and I know you have a, don't have much time, so I'll go over it in a quick fashion here. Section one and the last section of the bill are related. Right now in rule, it states as we list Superfund sites, we have to use the federal scoring system that was put in place in 1990. EPA updated that in 2018, and the big reason is the inclusion of soil vapor and the and vapor intrusion being added into the scoring. So now when the state and federal government scores a site that's looking to be listed on both, we have two different scores. All we're asking to do in the put in statute is that we use the most up-to-date EPA scoring system and then repeal the rule that has the old one that has a specific site so that we don't have to come back in the, the future. We just do this once and as that information keeps getting updated, we use the most uh, the most reliant. The next provisions really are span three sections and that's section two, three, and four of the bill. And this deals with our closed landfill program and specifically priority qualified facilities that are in that program. Just a, a quick history here, a background that's helpful on what the closed landfill program is. It was enacted in 1994 as an alternative to Superfund to address old landfills and ensure that they were being cleaned up. Uh, prior to that, the Superfund program had a lot of legal and administrative actions moving forward, but little cleanup. And this was a, a way to move forward and address those sites. Part of that legislation created a an agreement, uh, a deal between the states and the landfill owner. The state would take care of the property, do the cleanup needed, any construction, and take care of it into perpetuity. On the other hand, the landfill owner needed to provide its insurance records to the state, which the state did successfully do some cost recovery against insurance companies, and then to allow the state to do the required remedial and cleanup work. Unfortunately, we had a, excuse me, fortunately, 109, this worked very well. Our 110th, when we started going into this, it did not work well and it broke down. And in 2017, the legislature created 
another category, which is the priority qualified facilities. For those uncooperative landfill owners that were not keeping up their part of the deal, it gave the state ability to actually do the work and then seek back cost recovery or other types of actions to make sure that human health and the environment were protected. And so as the agency started looking through that and uh, applying that to its first landfill, we noticed there were a couple things that could be improved. And the bill really here does two things. It, it would benefit the state and the landfill owners. The first, it protects the state and the state's taxpayers um, by allowing it to better recover expenses from uncooperative landfill owners and also prevents the uncooperative landfill owner from receiving an unjust financial windfall. The second is it also protects the landfill owner from any double liability. It ensures that the state acquires the property in a fair manner if it uses the condemnation process. And so I'm just going to quickly highlight the three problems that were identified and that we're solving through this bill. The first is if the state were to move forward and use condemnation as a way to gain access and be able to do the cleanup, that it would do it in a way that is protective of the state's investments and also not require um, the state to go through a condemnation process, have the state make a payment, and have that person get a financial windfall, the uncooperative landfill owner. And the problem occurs in just how the process is set up. The condemnation starts off first, and what happens is at that point the appraisal is done and the state would then acquire the property and, and give over dollars for the compensation for getting the property. The cleanup would occur, and then because of the 2017 language then, the state would then come back and seek back the cost recovery for the cleanup. But in between that time, that money could be spent or put in places where the state could not get and reach it and when it comes back to actually collect it. So the state would be giving a windfall out, and then when it would come back and try to, to collect its cost, that even the money that the state had put there that we know that the former owner had is gone. And so what we're doing in this legislation, and it is section four, four of, the, of the bill, is what we're saying is let's do that all at once. We do the condemnation at the same time. We look at what the cost and the compensation for the, the property owner is, and at the same time find out what the cost of the remediation is. We look and see if there's a difference there. If the cost of the cleanup is less or remediation is less than the worth of the property, the state then provides dollars for compensation to that landowner. If it isn't, then the state moves forward and acquire the property. This fixes that problem where there isn't an unjust windfall or that the state taxpayer's investment is not protected. In doing so, we also put provisions in here to protect the landowner. One, um, and there has been court cases on this, where the concern is that the state or a public entity would purchase the land, ask for a very low price, saying it's contaminated or needs a lot of work, and then later another agency or that same entity would come back later seeking cost recovery for the cleanup. So someone is getting double hit. What we've done in here explicitly state is the state would have to use the property value of the cleaned up value if it is to come and ask for the cleanup value. So the landowner is being treated fairly and so that they're only getting um, to be asked to, to do the thing once, not twice. And so we've set that up in a way here through the, the process so that it is, it is fair for the landfill owner and also the state. Um, a uh, uh, related fix to that, too, is that after the condemnation process is completed, allowing, um, if the state has to surplus the land, the state would not sell it back to the property owner for the cost of, of what it was. Um, so, for instance, if there, the cleanup costs were more than the property's worth, the person would get the land back for a nominal fee, about $500. This would undo everything else that the legislature has put in place in the 2017 legislation and treat them like they were a cooperative landowner. And so we also make that change, that loophole. The second problem we had is if the state actually went onto the property, didn't need to or didn't acquire the property, the state would do the work, put a lien on the property to recover its cleanup costs. There are ways then the state could never actually collect on that lien. And one of that is if someone were to use the property to earn an income. For instance, if they just rented it out to store some um, 
old vehicles on it. That would be enough to prevent the state and the taxpayers from coming back and recollecting its investment. The same with a, a six year limit. So basically the landfill property owner could short, um, short change the state by just running out the, the clock. And so we, per, in section three of the bill, remove those restrictions that are placed on the state to ensure the state can get back its, its investment. The third thing that this bill does, and is also in that same section, is something we heard loud and clear from the legislature here when we came and talked about one of these facilities in the past. And that was concern of an unjust windfall um, for a property when the cleanup may be substantial, uh, but that the, the value increase in the property was, was more than that. that was, so what we put in here is a windfall lien saying that if the property increases in value because of the state's investment in the cleanup, the state then can lien for the increased amount in the value of the property because of the cleanup. That is because of the state and taxpayers' investment, so the state then can collect back that part that it improved the property. So what we do is we find out what the property is worth before the cleanup and afterwards, and that difference is what the state is in, entitled to through a lien. And so those are the three things that we've fixed in this provision. I, I just want to make one, um, two quick caveats just to make sure quick. it's, it's <laughs> yep, it, clear, is that um, even under these actions, it is likely the states will not be able to collect the full amount of the cleanup cost. And just to be clear on that, because the property values in these type of mm -hmm. situations will be less than the cleanup pieces. Just want everyone to go in wide, eyes wide open. The second, if the property owner still at this point decides to enter into a binding agreement, becomes a cooperative landfill owner, the state would have to do the cleanup, pay that investment, and the person could then use the property in any way they want afterwards and not have any liens or anything against them. That is just the deal that was for the other 109 and just want to be clear, I know that is something that has been talked about at the legislature, especially when we're talking about some of these cleanups being in the hundreds of millions of, of dollars on these properties. Just to, so that is, is clear because that is what the existing law allows. The, the last real quick piece then on this bill is section five and this is about environmental covenants. And this is about landfills that have closed, that are not in the closed landfill program. And what this allows for and what the solid waste rules have is that there would be, need to be some type of notification on the property deed so that if someone were to purchase the property or they would have to keep up certain types of actions. What this allows is the use of the Environmental Covenants and under the Environmental Covenants Act uh, that was passed in 2007, which is after the solid waste regs went into place, it envisioned that environmental covenants would be used for closure, or contingency, and corrective actions at disposal facilities. The difference is the Environmental Covenants Act requires us to hook that up to each program. And so in the past, the legislature has allowed this ability to be used for Superfund. A few years ago, we came before the legislature and asked for this authority to be used for petroleum sites. And now we're asking for this uh, tool to be used for the solid waste program. Just to be very clear, an environmental covenant cannot be placed on one of these properties without the property owner's approval. But this does allow for more um, upfront information when there are property transactions. We have had cases, for instance, south of Austin where an old uh, demolition landfill was sold to various folks and they didn't know that there were restrictions, that they couldn't take actions that to disturb the, the cat. So the farmer wanted to plant soybeans and, and was not allowed to and didn't know that going in. A notification which is allowed under solid waste regs is like a post-it note, easily lost when you're looking through documents. An environmental covenant is something the attorneys are going to see and make sure the, the property owner knows and that can later be uh, pointed to to make sure those actions are being taken place. This not only happens in rural areas, this happened in um, urban areas. In Winona when there was a development of, of some large box retail stores and they wanted to build on an old disposal site, we also had issues where they were unaware that disturbing the, the cap and the cover would create problems. And so this is what this law is hopefully, to, the proposals to do is to put in the law ways to protect those situations from occurring in the future, protecting those who have closed the landfill and those who have bought the property. Uh, Chair and committee members, thanks for the time. I Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right, we'll move on to member discussion. Representative Wagenius. 
Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to go to your first point on the Superfund site on lines uh, 1.12 and 13. So the implication of your testimony was that uh, the federal government standards for Superfund sites would always get stronger. And that's hard to believe these days. <laughs> uh, with EPA rolling back rules all over the place. So we could then, with this language, be in the position of having lower standards for Superfund sites. Uh, Mr. Kadelka. Chair and, and committee members, thank you for the, the question. This would have the most up-to-date information and the scoring system that the feds use. Currently, the feds use a scoring system that would have a higher score because it brings in the soil vapors. The scoring system is what is used to get onto the, the list. The cleanup, the standards that we clean it up to or when things need to be cleaned up are a different set of regulations, not connected to this. This really is um, the process where we do the listing, we have to score to provide it to the public, the information, and if it scores high enough, it gets on the federal list. The state list doesn't have a threshold. You have to score 28.5 for the feds. The state list, there is not that number. And then we do the cleanup on a different set of, of regs. Representative Guineas. The point is that um, for scoring, the federal government could roll back. And so lands that should be going on the Superfund list or sites that should be going on the Superfund list wouldn't make it because the federal government has rolled back. Assistant Commissioner Kadelka. Chair and committee members, that would be the case for the federal where they have to hit a threshold of 28.5 points. On the state, that would not be the case. There is not that threshold. So we score as a part of the exercise to get it onto the, onto the site listing and proposal but you don't have to hit a score to be listed on there. A very low score could still get you on there because it's a tool to open up tools, authorities, and financing the state can use to work on a cleanup. So as long as there's a, a scoring system there, it, it's more, the state is still protected to be able to put on a, its list when it may not be put on the federal list. Representative Wiginius. I, I remain concerned about this particular language. Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just one real quick question for the for the bill author, because this is uh, obviously deals with uh, land titles and and other things that aren't normal purview of uh, uh, this committee. Uh, do you anticipate after finance this may go to government ops or judiciary? In other words, there there are some other areas that look like they're touched. Uh, Representative Lewick, the motion is to move it to judiciary and civil law. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Oh, I see what it did. Oh, good. <laughs> That's all I need to know. Chair Madam Chair, Reverend Blue, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Chair Purcell, any closing comments? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, appreciate the, the conversation around this bill and uh, just uh, ask for your consideration and approval. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chair Purcell renews his motion that House File 4058 as amended be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Chair Purcell, <laughs> now we've got House File 4286. Uh, would you like to move your bill? Let me, uh, yes. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I move House File 4286 uh, be approved and, and move to uh, Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. All right, Chair Purcell moves 428, House File 4286 to Judiciary, <coughs> Finance, and Civil Law. Chair Purcell, do you want to go ahead and introduce your bill or do you want to go straight to uh, Assistant Commissioner? Gothier. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, the Commissioner will uh, walk through the bill, so we cut right to the chase and go to the bill. Thank right. you. Please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair members. My name is Greta Gothier, um, Assistant Commissioner, MPCA. Madam Chair, I just have a couple of brief uh, framework or context for the bill and then I'll walk through it. Um, Madam Chair members, this bill is the uh, agency's bill that is coming in the wake of two major enforcement actions that we have been heavily involved in in the last 
recent time. Um, what this bill does is it clarifies and makes uniform our existing enforcement tools that are available to the PCA commissioner. All and everything about this bill is intended to better protect Minnesotans and the environment. This bill clarifies, as I said, several enforcement tools that we already have, including uh, reopening permits for permit violators, ordering the facilities of permit violators to cease operations, holding violated, violating permittees accountable for what they agreed to do to remedy their violations, leveling the playing field between those facilities who get the permits that they need and those who do not, and making the availability of enforcement tools uniform across all programs. This bill is needed because Commissioner Bishop and Assistant Commissioner Tester and the agency want to be very clear and transparent to all facilities and all permittees so that they, everyone knows how they intend to move forward with enforcement in the future. Walking through the bill, Madam Chair, generally this bill is making changes to two statutes, Chapter 115 and Chapter 116. So Chapter 115 is water pollution control, one of our major chapters for our activities. Chapter 116 is our enabling chapter that created the Pollution Control Agency. So first in chapter, we're making changes the same in both of those chapters. So on page one, line 21, you'll notice that we add the word reopen that allows the commissioner to, that clarifies that the commissioner has authority to reopen permits in certain circumstances. And then we skip to page six, Madam Chair, at the top. Um, and this is also under chapter 115 and remedies available to the commissioner for enforcement purposes, and it includes cease performance, ordering a permittee to cease performance. You'll note the commissioner already has authority to compel performance, and this is clarifying. That means also to Also then on um, subdivision, or section three, line 6.8, stipulates that in her use of an injunction, the commissioner may also require a facility to cease operations and conditions on when they have to be open. I don't know where that is. And, and of course, Bill, the <laughs> our, our staff person has left the room. If we need to find him again. I'll just, for John. Um, in stipulation agreements, um, this is the section here, section four, starting on line 6.12, where we are saying that um, Violators, permit violators have to be accountable for what they agree to do in the stipulation agreements or other negotiated settlements designed to remedy their violations. And it makes them accountable to carry out those agreements. Then section five um, is where we, I had said that we will make uniform authorities. This is where that occurs. Under section five, the commissioner may bring an enforcement action against a person or a facility that is required to have a permit that fails to obtain a permit. The penalty for failure to obtain a permit under this section is increased for every year the person or the facility failed to obtain the permit. Mr. Chairman, if you, or I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Moving on to page seven at 7.15 is where we start making these exact same changes, exact same language in chapter 116. So section seven, section eight, and section nine make the same changes we made in chapter 115. Um, in the interest of time, Madam Chair, I will end my testimony here and be available for comments. All right. Is there or anyone questions? else in the audience uh, wishing to testify on this bill? Right. Uh, members, if anyone recently on stop for phone or anything, if you're looking at your 
table. Sign him up, Madam Chair. <laughs> yeah. Give him a hanger. All right, members, any discussion to House File 4286? All right, uh, Chair Purcell, any closing comments? Just um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, and appreciate the support for the bill. All right, Chair Purcell renews his motion that House File 4286 be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Divi uh, Division. All mm -hmm. those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Sandsteed. I'm done now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Chair, you're, fr you're free. Uh, so next up, we have House File 2383. I will move House File 2383 be referred to the Education Policy Committee. Um, this bill did get a full hearing last year, so we're going to try to keep things brief. However, there is an amendment. Uh, I will move the A20-0612 amendment to put the bill in the form the author wants. Uh, all those in favor of that amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Sandseed, please tell us about your bill as amended. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Um, as you stated, this bill was heard last year. It was heard after the deadline, so it was basically an informational hearing. Uh, since that time, or during that hearing, some questions arose. The amendment today is a result um, of some of the questions that were raised. This is what I'm calling our peace in the valley. Uh, House File 2383, as amended, clarifies some technical items regarding the position of the school trust lands director. The position was established in 2012 to provide recommendations to both the executive and legislative branches about the management of the state's school trust lands. After a couple of years of discussions about the appropriate responsibilities of this role, this is the Peace in the Valley solution to make overdue updates. Most significantly, the bill increases transparency by reorganizing the duties regarding the director's advice and recommendations requirements, reporting requirements, and other duties. It requires that they submit an annual budget as well as a plan with legislative recommendations for review to the Permanent School Trust Commission. It provides clarity by requiring the director to act in a fiduciary capacity for school trust land beneficiaries. It provides uniformity and consistency with other executive branch appointees. Finally, the bill provides flexibility by reducing restrictions to the director's ability to hire and retain employees. There are no fiscal implications in the bill. Last year's special session omnibus bill or omnibus environment and natural resource bill had a provision from this bill's original version, which modifies a prior appropriation for the school trust lands director to allow the use of money to complete a 25 year framework for managing school trust lands and extending the availability of the funds, which has been set to expire June 30th of last year. And I stand for any questions. All right, and we'll go uh, to the testifier first, if you can uh, introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. And I will remind uh, everybody who's waiting and those up for this bill that we do have several more bills to get through today. So if you could keep it brief, we'd all appreciate it. Go ahead. Madam Chair, Aaron Vandalin, Minnesota School Trust Lands Director. And I uh, first appreciate the opportunity to speak on uh, behalf of this bill again, uh, as we did last year. I don't need to belabor any of the points that Representative Sandstead made. I do uh, want to uh, wish my, uh, express my appreciation to the Permanent School Fund uh, Commission for working on this bill with our office over the last few years. Uh, with that, I have nothing further. All right. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right, we'll move on to member discussion. Members, any discussion of the bill? Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Sandstead, for uh, bringing this forward 
this bill has been worked on and and for quite some time, uh, actually even before last session. So, uh, you know, it's time to just get this thing moving. Uh, we seem to not be able to really get the kind of attention we need on the school trust uh, funds and the uh, huge part that plays in education. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get this thing out of here and uh, and ultimately get it in front of the governor. Uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Vandalin, and uh, to the author, thank you very much for all the work that we've been doing on this. As Representative Purcell mentioned, this has been going on for a long time. Since I've been here, I believe back to 2011 and 12, we started having conversations about the role of the director and so forth, and uh, this is uh, something that I think is very, very important, and I applaud you for the good work. But I do have one question for Director Vandalin. It says in the bill that it removes the cap of five employees. Director Vandalin, do you have any idea where you would go uh, in the near future in terms of an expansion of your workforce? Director. Madam Chair, Representative Fabian, members, the, uh, currently the school trust office has two and a half employees, including myself. Uh, we're looking to hire one additional staff person at this time. I would note in the bill it does uh, limit the ability of the director to hire staff to any available appropriation. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, all those in favor of uh, House File, I will renew my motion that House File 2383 as amended uh, be referred to education policy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Representative Sandsteed. Next up, we have House File 3867, Representative Moeller. Uh, I will move that House File 3867 be referred to the Ju <laughs> Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. Um, it does look like we do have uh, a DE-1 amendment. Uh, I will move the DE-1 amendment to put the bill in the form that the author wants. Uh, all those in favor of the DE-1 amendment, please say aye. No. Opposed? They're all focusing on their treats. Um, <laughs> thank you, Representative Moeller. Uh, the motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Representative Moeller, please uh, tell, about, uh, tell us about your bill as amended. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to be in front of this committee for the first time. Um, I did bring treats. Representative Claflin got a little grief and just downstairs in judiciary for not having treats. So if there are any leftovers, I can take those down and share those with members of my committee on her behalf. Um, so um, I just wanted to uh, let you know that this bill is an agency bill. And um, it has to do with data practices and data privacy. So we will be hearing this in Judiciary Committee. And I just wanted to um, turn it over to the department. But before I do, thank them for working with the Minnesota Coalition of Government Information. That's what the DE1 yes. amendment does. It really clarifies what kind of data is going to be, um, be kept confidential. And I really appreciate the work that the agency did with that coalition, which is very going to be very important to us in the Judiciary Committee when the bill gets there. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, if I could turn it over to my testifier, please. Yep, sounds good. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record, and then go ahead with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Robert Carey. I am a staff attorney in the General Counsel's Office for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, uh, part of my job is to advise the department on, on the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act and, and Chapter 13 in the Minnesota statutes. Uh, and as uh, the representative has uh, alluded to, I helped craft some of the, uh, the language of this bill. Uh, the bill that you have before you um, it is, is really aimed at uh, making uh, data on individuals who are minors private data. As a, as a government agency, uh, the DNR maintains uh, government data, and sometimes that government data uh, is on individuals who are under, under the age of 18. Uh, some examples of this can include um, uh, hunting and, and fishing license applications, uh, safety training programs, or information generated from a, a, a DNR state-sponsored state event, uh, for, for instance, uh, an event that's held on a, on a state park. Uh, uh, DNR feels that it's important that this type of data uh, receive an added layer of protection that it currently doesn't have under uh, Chapter 13 of the Minnesota Statutes. Uh, the Data Practices Act has a presumption 
that all government data be made public data um, unless there is an explicit provision of Chapter 13 saying otherwise. Uh, currently, there is no explicit provision under Chapter 13 that makes minor data on individuals private data. So what we're trying to do here is exactly that, making uh, data that's maintained on individuals who are under the age of 18 private data. Um, as uh, the representative has also mentioned uh, in working up this bill, we've reached out to the Minnesota Coalition on Government Information. Uh, that is the, the impetus for the amendment that you have before you. Uh, it represents a um, accommodation on Minkoji's desire to uh, sort of narrow the scope of this bill and, and really drill down on those categories that you see in items one through 10. Um, so the, the, the language before you is a, a, is a result of those discussions. It's supported by both uh, Minnesota DNR and uh, Minkoji. Um, I'm, I'm that sort of wraps up the summary of, of the bill. I'm happy to make myself avail available for any questions on any of the details of the bill from, from the members. All right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll make sure there aren't any other testifiers first. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right, nobody's, nobody's moving, so I'm guessing that's a no. Uh, we'll move on to member discussion. Members, any discussion? Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, on uh, line 2.1, uh, we talk about other data. Would that include uh, pictures, for example, that maybe the DNR had acquired at an event of... Uh, uh, Minors involved in a some type of DNR event, Mr. Carey. Madam Chair, Representative, it, it would if that that data could identify if it's if an individual who is a minor is identifiable in those pictures that would be wrapped up in that category. Yes, Second, Representative. Lewis. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Second part of that would then if it was in you know mutual uh, benefit that the the minor uh, and the DNR wanted to actually use that for something in a magazine or, or some type of a educational thing. Is there a provision there so that you could get a, a release from the parents or the, the minor to actually use that in public or make it non-public, I guess is the way to describe it. Mr. Carey. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, uh, the, the classification that's being contemplated by this bill is private data on individuals, which would make the data not public for everybody but the subject of the data. So if the minor would request the subject uh, or request the data themselves or the minor's guardian would request the data themselves, we would be obligated to, to turn it over mm -hmm. in that instance. The, Represent fluid. Yeah, and it might just, and not a concern, but just to make sure we don't tie ourselves up too tight that if you wanted to use something uh, uh, from the DNR's perspective in a publication or whatever, and you, you know, making sure you could go through the process, if that was acceptable with the parents and that individual, that obviously if you stuck a picture in there and, uh, and it had a, a minor uh, there, um, that certainly would be release of, uh, that they were involved in, in something. So I just want to make sure we don't unintentionally encumber, make it too hard to do the proper education thing because kids like to see kids doing things. So otherwise, yeah, this certainly makes all the sense in the world. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We wouldn't want to hold up any uh, no child left inside uh, coverage in the in the volunteer for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> members, any further discussion to the bill? All right, uh, Representative Moeller, any closing comments? No, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll renew my motion that House File 3867 as amended be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Yep, thank you. All right, next up we have House File 3847, uh, Representative Mann. Uh, I will move uh, House File 3847 be referred to the Committee on Commerce. There's also an author's amendment. I will move the A, it is the, I'm going to double check, the A1 amendment uh, put, to put the bill in the form the author wants. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Representative Mann, uh, please tell us about your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. House File 3847 is a small step in getting us to change the way we shop. This bill does not ban anything. It simply seeks to foster change in behavior so that we as a society can depend less on single-use plastics. 
We know that single-use plastics are harmful to the environment. We know that about only 9% of all plastics that we use actually get recycled. Most of it ends up in landfills, floating around in the ocean, or just gets stuck in our natural world. And we use about 100 billion single-use plastic bags per year in the United States. So, what of breath, sorry. <laughs> So what this bill does is that it charges a small fee of five cents on single-use plastic bags. This fee can be increased at the discretion of the retailer. And what's unique about our bill is that that fee stays with the retailer. We just ask that they use a portion of it to provide reusable bags that people can purchase. And the, we also give the retailer the ability to um, charge a small fee for uh, paper bags if they wish as well. So what it comes down to is that we want people to live with less plastic and change old behaviors. Uh, and that is our goal today. We want to reduce waste. And instead of asking people to reduce, reuse, and recycle, we want people to refuse. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, we do have a couple of people on the list to testify. Uh, Priscilla Villa Watt. She's here. Um, looks like maybe not. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to testify on this bill? All right, All right. well, we'll move on to discussion. Members, uh, any discussion? Representative Lewick. Uh, to the bill author, uh, does the Attorney General uh, uh, buy into this and, and uh, they discuss any potential new costs that the, uh, that, uh, department would end up incurring enforcing this? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, yeah, so we, um, you know, we are making a new um, a fee for a new violation. Uh, the AG has not commented on it. I haven't heard from them at all, but this will likely incur a, a fee. Representative Lewick. I guess one other quick, so um, would somebody complain or file a complaint to the Attorney General and then how would, how would this be triggered? That we get into this, is it $1,000 a bag fee if they violate? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, no, it's $1,000 per day for a violation. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how many bags they didn't charge for that day. The, Representative Lewick. So as I understand this, then if somebody uh, declined to put this in force, uh, every day after this goes into effect, they would be subject to a $1,000 a day fine. Is that how it works? Representative Madam, Mann. Madam Chair, our representative, yes. Representative Lewick. Well, that seems like a, that, that's not exactly uh, carefully convincing people to uh, uh, make a conscious decision. That, that seems like pretty onerous, uh, particularly uh, they're not all Walmarts and they're not all great big grocery stores. There's lots of little stores out there. Uh, so I don't know, I got some real angst over using a sledgehammer and that's what I think that that kind of a everyday penalty is uh, uh, so anyway I I, uh, I can't I can't support this uh, with that kind of a sledgehammer approach members all we we rarely agree on everything in this room representative Heinzman may have and I may have agreed four times but you know <laughs> in four years uh, <laughs> uh, representative Fabian uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Representative Mann, you said that it's per day, but can you show me specifically in the bill where the penalty is per day, not per bag? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, we can certainly make that more clear. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Mann, you referred to the bags as single-use <laughs> bags. They're not single-use bags. They're recyclable. Correct? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, our Representative, they are um, theoretically recyclable, but they cannot be readily recyclable um, at your curbside. And again, only uh, less than 10% of them are actually recycled. Represent Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, um, I know in my house, uh, every time I, not every time, but when I go to our local Super One grocery store, 
I take the plastic bags and I put them in the recycling box. So the idea that these are single-use bags, I, I, I think, is uh, obviously inaccurate. <coughs> um, so who's going to be the plastic bag police? Representative, if Representative Mann would ask, answer a question. Representative please. Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, right now, we have charged the AG's office to um, be that, uh, but we don't have a uh, specific uniformed force that would be around policing plastic bags. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Mann, so, but walk me through this then. How is this actually going to work? Who's going to go out and check on businesses to see if they're complying? Are we going to do surprise checks like they do uh, uh, businesses selling tobacco to minors? What? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, so this is not, you know, the perp we, we made the bill as lenient as possible, truthfully, right? We're asking the, the retailers to keep their fee. Um, we are not having someone go out and inspect stores. We, a lot of the stores in our state are already charging fees for bags. And so we feel like most people want to do the right thing here. Um, so that's, that's the way it's going to work. We're going to rely on people to do the right thing. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Representative Mann, I appreciate that. But you're not asking people to do the right thing. You are telling people what they have to do, correct? <clears throat> Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, um, no. So we are saying that you should charge a fee for a bag. We are saying that. Um, and then we are also saying, again, that you can keep that fee. The state is not collecting that. We are also not sending police to every store to uh, enforce this. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. But Representative Mann, here you just said that again. You are telling, you just said that you should charge for the bag. Correct. But the way I read it, you must charge for the bag. Mm -hmm. What? Which is it? You Rep must charge for the bag, Mann. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Representative Heintzman. All right, Representative Lewick. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I think this is just completely out of line, and, and I want to ask for a roll call vote because I want to make darn sure my small grocery stores uh, absolutely understand where at least I stand on this uh, unequivocally because thousand dollars a day I mean we've got grocery stores that are barely the size of uh, this room and uh, and Attorney General running around uh, become the plastic bag police guy I, I just uh, think we're we're way overstepping what we should be focused on here in st. Paul okay. uh, roll call is noted uh, representative Anderson thank you madam chair um, I may have missed this uh, but to the bill author could you please again explain the reason for the amendment Representative oh, Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Representative. So the amendment um, exempts certain populations from this fee, specifically people who are on TANF, WIC, or SNAP. Representative Anderson. I would just ask why. Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, because again, we wanted to make this as less burdensome on people as possible. We don't want to you know, charge a dollar per bag and put a financial strain on people. We don't want to put financial strains on people who are already financially strained. And that's also the reason why in the bill we um, stipulated that retailers can keep that fee because we're not trying to put a fee on retailers either. Representative Anderson. So it will raise the cost of uh, grocery items for everybody but the people on your amendment, correct? No. It doesn't Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, not if you bring your own bag. What if you don't bring Representative them? Anderson. Madam Chair, Representative. Representative Mann. Then you can get uh, a plastic bag or you can purchase a reusable bag and then bring your own bag next time. But will it, increase, will it increase the cost of food? If I don't bring my own bag, will it increase my cost to buy groceries? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, it depends on how many bags you'll need. It'll be five cents per bag. Representative Anderson. Will it increase the cost of my groceries no. at the store? Okay. Madam Chair. Representative Mann. Representative, no. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Well, where does the five cents come from? Okay. Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, it comes from anyone wishing to uh, get a bag at the grocery store. So Representative Anderson. So it's my cost then. 
Madam Representative Chair, Mann. If you get a plastic bag. So it will Representative raise my, Anderson. It will raise my cost of whatever's in that bag then. No. Representative Mann. Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, <laughs> no. What's in the bag is stays the same cost. <laughs> Thank you. Representative Anderson. Will my bill be higher when I walk out of that store? <laughs> Representative Mann. <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative, your bill will depend on <laughs> how many groceries you get, how many bags you use. I, I, I can't answer how, what you pay for your groceries. Right I know now. some people like to double bag, so I guess they'd be paying 10 cents <laughs> if they really <laughs> wanted to do that. Uh, anything further, Representative Anderson? No. All right, uh, Representative Bo. No. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two quick questions. First of all, well, a statement perhaps. Pet owners everywhere are, are disappointed because a lot of pet owners rely on plastic bags for cleaning up after their dog when they walk them in the neighborhood or cleaning the cat box at home and making sure that the paper bag doesn't burst and drop that material all over the living room floor. So this will make that cost more. Uh, but the question then, unrelated to that discussion, but uh, are the fees then that are collected by the store considered to be income? And, Recorded as such and taxable as such. Representative Mann. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to look into that for you. Right. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Anderson's <clears throat> questions started to get the gears moving again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've heard Representative Mann mention five cents, and then I've also heard you know, mention a dollar. First, is there a cap as to how much a retailer might charge for a plastic bag? Representative Mann. Also, thank oh. you, I'm just going to add to that, Madam Chair. I'm also curious if the representative has done any kind of research to see how many plastic bags go through an average grocery store in a day and how much we're talking about in terms of uh, volume. Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, so uh, we did not put a cap on how much you charge you can charge, we put a base of five cents. And we left that open specifically because we want retailers and small businesses to have the freedom to charge what they think is appropriate. Um, as far as how many bags per store, that varies greatly on the size of the store. Um, again, we know that as a country, it's about 100 billion bags per year. We also know that um, several countries have banned bags entirely. Um, or have imposed a small fee. And in the countries that have imposed a small fee, like Ireland, South Africa, UK, we've seen decrease in use of bags up to 90%. That's 90% less plastic bags in our environment. We've also seen studies done in Washington or in Chicago that have decreased, a uh, five cent fee has decreased the use of plastic bags by over 50%. So again, it's not, uh, in, in every place that this has been enacted, the people are ready for it uh, to, the, to the tune of 50% less usage of plastic bags and 50% less plastic in our environment. So. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment. Um, there's a lot of giggling about the idea of the cost of groceries going up. The bottom line, if grocery stores around the state increase the cost of packaging, that causes my household or any other household who may not have had the foresight to have all of the cloth bags ready before we go to the grocery store, or maybe this just isn't for them. Your costs overall go up, and Representative Anderson is making that point only to be responded to by giggling. That affects families around the entire state. And maybe even to Representative Lewick's point, it affects businesses that may not get the memo and may make a mistake, and it could cost them $1,000 a day because they just miss the fact that this bill, if it were to become law, please God, I hope not, but if it did, they could wind up with thousands of dollars of fine while the other side of the table giggles. This is serious, and it hurts businesses and it hurts individuals in a significant way. And I'll just remind members that the A1 amendment did uh the fee won't be charged to folks who qualify based on, on income. Uh, Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, the cost of packaging does not go up. It stays exactly the same. 
um, especially for the retailer. Um, and also, I would be happy to entertain any amendments to decrease that fine or to even um, let the first and second violation go unfined completely. I have no problem with that. Uh, Representative Green, we've got uh, quite the list going. I'll remind members we have two more bills on the calendar. We do have testifiers from out of town uh, from one of, for one of those bills. So, uh, Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Heinzman. You made one of my points as far as thinking it's funny that your cost is going to go up. Now, you've, you've, you've deleted some people here. Now, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Maybe you could uh, inform me as to does pe do people have to go in and, and then say, hey, uh, I fit into these these programs here, so you can't charge me. And also, uh, what do you do with the people who are on Social Security that aren't on another program, but are you know we hear it all the time. They're they're trying to make the decision: do they buy groceries today, or do they pay, pick up their prescriptions? Or how come they're not included? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative. Um what was the first part of your question? <laughs> Representative Green. <laughs> Let's just go. Let's just go with the why aren't the social, people on Social Security, and how do you know how much money a person has, basically? Right. Representative Mann. Yeah. So uh, most people who are on WIC or TANF or SNAP have some kind of identification or a card with them that they use to pay. So that would be easily delineated at the checkout. Um, as far as the Social Security population, we that was just not something that we thought of, honestly. Um, but that's a really great point, and I would. I would absolutely uh, entertain adding them to the list as well. All right, uh, Representative Lippert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Mann, for bringing this bill forward. Um, this is an issue I've been interested in a while, and it's um, a conversation that's, that's bubbling at the local level in, in Northfield, in my district. Um, speaking of the recyclability of these single-use plastic bags, it was brought up earlier um, in some conversations I've had with those who are responsible for uh, this recycling and sorting recyclables. The plastic bags get caught up in the machinery and cause a significant um, loss of efficiency and, and lots of problems for those who are recycling. So they see them as a nuisance. Um, so I think anything we can be doing to reduce the usage of single-use plastic bags is extremely important. Um, and also want to speak to the cost issue just briefly. If, if you're shopping, have five plastic bags, um, you know, it's 25 cents. So um, I, think, um, I think this is a reasonable proposal. Um, and if it can change our use, I think that's extremely helpful. Uh, Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Lippert brought up um, the point I wanted to make, and that was really about um, the recycling of plastic bags and, and pitching them in with our single sort isn't how they should be handled, and so oftentimes they don't get recycled. Um, and I also wanted to say that because we have all this single-use plastic, we are coming up with microplastics in our in our um, lakes and streams and waterways. And so this is a the, the use of plastics is a big is a big issue. And so um, thank you for bringing the bill forward. And in regards to any um, laughing or snickering, it had nothing to do with the cost of. Uh, Groceries. It had to do with the exchange that was happening between the representatives regarding clarification. And so, uh, do apologize if I do apologize if there was any disrespect taken. It was certainly not intended. Um, I appreciate the um, intent behind the bill, and I appreciate um, the support you have. So. Representative Purcell, Chair Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a point of clarification, I, I support the bill and thank you for bringing it, Representative Mann. And, uh, just in regard to the cost of, of, of groceries that we pay as we walk out of our and pay our bill at the grocery store, um, and I, I don't know if, if uh, what, what to say about Bemidji, but we've got a grocery store up there that's been, they take a nickel or dime off your bill right off it if you bring your own bag in there instead of having them bag it up in plastic. And they've been doing this for a couple of years. I mean, this is, I don't know if we're special people up there, maybe, but uh, we've got stores that are, that are doing this stuff. And, and uh, they're doing it for the right reasons that, uh, as we just heard, plastic's all over our environment. If, if it doesn't bring a tear to your eye when you see a plastic bag up in a pine tree hanging on a branch, come on. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous what's going on with plastic in our environment. Thank you. You can save some a couple cents at Caribou too if you bring your 
your coffee mug. So, uh, Representative Wagenius. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Representative Heinzman is correct. This is serious. And it's a serious reduction in cost to taxpayers who are managing all this waste. So if you listen carefully uh, to Representative Mann, uh, who talked about the amount of waste reduction, then that's a reduction in cost to taxpayers. So I'm actually very grateful that you called for a roll call. Uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Mann, every time I go to my local grocery store, they ask me a paper or plastic. And oftentimes they'll take paper simply because uh, <coughs> our logging industry reply, relies on uh, making paper. But my question is, is what prevents the store from charging for the bags now? Representative Mann. Madam Chair, Representative, nothing. And in fact, a lot of stores do already charge for bags. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So then why do we need this bill? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, because we want stores to be charging for bags. We want to change our behavior. We want to use less plastics. We want to decrease pollution in the environment. All right. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Mann, for bringing this bill to us. There is a cost to plastic. Um, it's a cost that's unseen. Representative Purcell is right. I think if we walked outside right now, we'll see plastic bags blowing in the wind. There will probably be some hung up on the trees or in the shrubs outside of this building. So putting a cost to help reduce them versus trying to recover them through recycling, which has not worked, volunteer. I've been putting bags in the fronts of grocery stores where they've had the receptacles. But a lot of that went to China, and it's not going there anymore. Recycling is not going to save us. Recycling is not going to save us. We have to reduce the use of plastic. I just had someone say that a grocery store may spend 150 to 200,000 on bags per year. If we can reduce that, that's a cost savings for the grocery store. And then if there's a charge, it helps pay for the cost of those plastic bags where maybe they don't slip away. Maybe they don't blow in the wind. Maybe they don't end up in our lakes. Maybe they don't end up in turtles. Maybe they don't end up wrapped around eagles. Then I think we've done what we should be doing, which is trying to protect all of us. We are part of this environment. I haven't found anybody yet who wants to be drinking and eating plastic. <laughs> but we, I think folks may have seen the, the, a new species was found, I think, in the Marianas Trench. What's inside of it? Plastic. This is a small step that is not punitive. It provides for choice and shows the true cost. If there's change, I think this bill is going to the judiciary or yes. somewhere where the penalty can be modified if needed to make it more incentive-based. But I think it's time. So I would support the bill, and I'm glad there's a roll call. Right, and I will remind members this is uh, <coughs> the motion is that this would move on to commerce. Uh, thank you all for the discussion. Representative Mann, any quick closing comments, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we know this is an effective way to reduce plastic waste. We've seen it work everywhere it's been implemented. Um, it decreases our global warming potential, our freshwater aquatic ecotoxicity, our marine aquatic toxicity, and terrestrial ecotoxicity. I appreciate your support. All right, a roll call having been requested. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Purcell? Aye. Becker Finn? Yes. Lewick? No. Acom? Yes. Anderson? No. Bo? No. Claflin? Yes. Fabian? No. Gomez? Yes. Green? No. Hansen? Yes. Heinzman? No. Lippert? Yes. Lislagard? No. Wigenius? Yes. With uh, eight ayes and seven nays, uh, the motion passes. Uh, so it would be House File 3847 be referred to the Committee in on Commerce. Thank you, Manager. Yeah, thank you. And you're not going anywhere. Uh, next up uh, on the agenda is House File 3338, 
Um, also a representative man bill and members we do have this room until 1130 we do not have a room for this evening so if we want to get to both bills uh, let's all uh, stay as focused as possible. Uh, I will move House File 3338 be referred to the Committee on Commerce. I see that there is an author's amendment. I will move the A1 amendment uh, to get the bill in the form the author wants. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, the motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Mann, uh, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, House File 3338 is a very simple bill that simply states that when you go out to eat, a pile of straws will no longer be dropped on your table. If you want a straw, you just have to ask for one. The point of this bill, again, same thing as, as the last bill, is to give us a second of pause before we go on using single-use plastics so that we can start to change our behaviors and use less single-use plastics, which again, we know end up polluting our environment. Um, environmentalists and behavioral scientists have noted that letting go of a single piece of plastic could be the first step to a much needed larger behavioral change. Uh, to clarify, this bill is not a ban on straws. The amendment uh, actually fixes a problem that um, you felt was important in the last bill is that it decreases the, the violation fees. Uh, and removes the fine for the first violation. Uh, thank you, Representative Mann. Uh, is there anyone in the audience uh, wishing to testify on this bill? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to member discussion. Uh, we just had a very spirited debate on single-use plastics. Uh, so again, let's try to stay focused. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering if Representative Mann has been able to find a source for uh, paper straws or otherwise uh, that does not contain PFAS. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have not done that research because I did not ban plastic bills in this bill, plastic straws in this bill, Representative. Right, Representative Heinzman. Just a comment, Madam Chair. Uh, I haven't. I did, I did do some research and it may be that this bill is a little bit of a head of the actual product that is available. And as this committee knows, and many of those watching at home know, PFAS is a huge problem, and our recycled straws wind up in compost facilities. And compost facilities are struggling greatly as we find PFAS and leachate and in solids. And one of the primary upstream sources are products like this. Um, I'll remind members, if you go to uh, line 1.15, uh, this bill doesn't ban the use of plastic straws. It's just saying that uh, an establishment must not provide or sell a single-use plastic straw unless requested by the person, uh, Representative Mann, if you have any further comment to that. No, that is correct, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Lewick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, who specifically would enforce this? Representative Mann, and I believe has this bill, this bill is on its way to commerce. So, okay. Representative Thank you. Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, same thing with the other bill. As far as I know, it would be under the AG's office jurisdiction. Representative Lewick. Well, at least out where I live, uh, the folks that are serving beverages uh, have a food and beverage license, and that's in uh, at least uh, one county, that's a delegated authority. Uh, and they issue the license next door to the state of Minnesota through the Department of uh, Health issues the license. So are we gonna somehow guess as to whether the Attorney General is gonna be the straw police or whether, whether you're gonna put this mandate uh, on uh, another department uh, or down at the county level? I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about food and beverage service. That's literally what that license uh, uh, allows them to do when they are under regulation. So I, again, roll call vote, please. Uh, I'm not gonna beat up uh, all the small establishments out in rural Minnesota where I live uh, with something like this, or take a chance that this is gonna be another brutal mandate on counties, particularly the ones that are delegated, that are out there doing a good job doing food and beverage licensing. Representative Mann. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I actually think that you're right, Representative. I do think that provisions would be enforced by MDH, uh, now that I think of it. Uh, but also, 
again, all the bill is saying is that if you want a straw, you ask for one. That's that's it. Uh, Representative Anderson. No, I uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there someone here from uh, the Attorney General's office or MDH to testify? I've got some questions. Uh, I don't think that there is. I will remind folks we are in the Environment Policy Committee. I know this bill has some other stops ahead of it. Uh, Representative Mann, any comment to that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, we have uh, probably at least two, if not three, other committees to go through where that stuff will be handled specifically. Uh, Representative Bo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just just a quick statement. I, I appreciate the fact that this is voluntary. It, it's not an outright ban, at least, you know, it's it's not providing the straw up front and it can be requested. So I appreciate the leniency and the flexibility in that area. All right. Uh, anyone, I'm not sure if I asked yet, is there anyone else in the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right. Uh, Representative Green. I just wanted to clarify that this bill does just a little bit more than only uh, uh, requires people to ask for a straw. It imposes a pretty stiff penalty if, uh, if out, of, out of sheer uh, repetition, uh, a server drops a straw on a table, somebody could say, I didn't ask for that straw and I'm turning you in. That's what this bill does. All right, uh, a roll call having been requested, uh, I would renew my motion that House File 3338 as amended be referred to the Committee on Commerce. Uh, we'll go ahead with the roll call. Purcell. Aye. Becker Fenn. Yes. Lewick. No. Acom. Yes. Anderson. No. Bo. No. Claflin. Yes. Fabian. No. Gomez. Yes. Green. No. Hansen. Yes. Heinzman. Lippert. Yes. List Lagarde. No. Wiginius. Yes. Right. With eight ayes and seven nays, uh, the motion carries. Thank you, Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. All right, our last bill on the agenda again. Uh, we do have the room for another 16 minutes, so hopefully that is sufficient. Uh, it is House File 848, uh, and I will be I will move that it be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, I do have an amendment that is labeled A1. I did speak briefly with the author about this amendment. Um, I don't think it undermines uh, what he's attempting to do. Uh, so the A1 amendment would uh, just clarify that if we have, uh, if there are special hunts going on in a jurisdiction, for instance, in my case, at a constituent who works for Three Rivers Park District, that they would still be able to limit the use of what type of firearms are used if they're in a more populated area or just choose to run their special hunt that way. Um, all those, uh, any further discussion to the A1 amendment? Representative Swidzinski. Yes, Madam Chair, I, I view that as a, a friendly amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The amendment passes. Uh, Representative Swidzinski, uh, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House File 848 um, is a pretty straightforward bill. It simply uh, eliminates the shotgun zone for taking deer uh, in Minnesota. Uh, this bill eliminates the shotgun zone during the regular firearm season. Uh, an exception is made, obviously, uh, with the amendment and also, I think, with other law potentially for allowing local units of government to have certain jurisdictions in this particular area. But this bill uh, really is before you uh, due to the strong shift in technology uh, with the advancement in Sabbat slugs coupled with a major shift uh, to rifle caliber pistols in all calibers. Uh, this bill is simply adding a few inches of barrel uh, to the tools deer hunters use to hunt. And with that, I have uh, folks with the uh, Minnesota Deer Hunters uh, here to, to speak on behalf of the bill and uh, appreciate your time. Right. Mr. Engwell, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Craig Engwell, I'm the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association Executive Director here on behalf of our 20,000 members and 60 chapters. Uh, through our grassroots process, our chapters can bring forward resolutions and our Des Moines Valley chapter in Wyndham brought forward a resolution that mirrors this legislation. Our first consideration in looking at things is safety, and so we look to DNR enforcement and DNR for those issues. They're the experts we aren't, and since they're not opposing this, then we look beyond that question to why should we do this? And one of the things, uh, there are a number of matters in the 
the uh, representative has brought those forward, but we look at the ease of use for young people. Uh, many smaller caliber rifles are easier to use than a shotgun with slug with more kick, et cetera. We're concerned about recruitment, and the more people can use things safely, the better we feel and the better recruiting opportunity there is. We also are, um, just like DNR, we're looking for simplifications of rules statewide. This uh, bill would do that. And because time is limited, I won't go into the other issues unless asked. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Engwall. Um, I do see uh, Colonel Smith from the DNR is here. I'm, you don't necessarily have to testify. You know, he said that the DNR is uh, okay with this. He's giving the thumbs up for the record. Uh, Colonel Smith from the DNR is giving the thumbs up uh, to this bill. Uh, is there anyone else from the audience wishing to testify on this bill? All right, members, uh, any discussion to the bill? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Szynski, I, I understand uh, in the farmland zone, you know, where there may be wide open horizon uh, where you can see your target, uh, I can see the support there. I am concerned about the hills. Uh, I'm concerned about the Karst region and the I'm concerned about the hills and the topography uh, of the southeast with rifle. And just for the record, I used rifle during uh, one of the special hunts for CWD. Um, I think that, you know, yeah, I understand the safety, that DNR is okay with this. I think you might find uh, some landowner concern in the southeast particularly, um, where the topography is such that that rifle shot may not be able to back it up, um, depending on how, how it is. So I'm cautious about uh, the southeast zone. I, I know this is being laid over, um, but I'm, I'm li and I understand the technology's changed. I understand, you know, what's happening out there. I understand about the rifle or the pistols, um, but I have a concern about just what stops the bullet in the southeast. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hanson, obviously, I think when you're out in the field and on a hunt, you know, the, the, the biggest thing you're always thinking about is safety. That you, always, you, don't, you only want to bring something home, but you also want to get home. And I think, you know, this doesn't stop landowners, uh, particularly, uh, you know, if they're allowing folks to hunt their land. Uh, I think they have the ability to say, you know, to allow technology. I mean, it's their land. If they want to have people hunt their land with shotgun, they can dictate that. Um, but also, I know there's been some special hunts uh, done uh, when they had some major drawdowns in the population in southeast Minnesota, uh, where they had a vast takedown of animals, and they allowed rifles to be used during those hunts for the general public, not just for sharpshooters. So there is some some history in the southeast, and I think looking at the boats uh, th that the the deer hunters, that was a particular area that showed an extra strong uh, preference uh, to for this particular legislation. Thank you, Representative Anderson. I had a question, but I can talk to the DNR off, offline, so thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, any further discussion to this bill? All right. Uh, Representative Swidzinski, any final comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I certainly appreciate being included in uh, any final bill moving forward. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I renew my motion that House File, well, I guess we're laying it over, so I will House File 3338 as, or that's not correct, uh, House File 848 as amended is laid over for possible, possible inclusion in a future bill. Thank you. All right. And uh, thank you, members, for the discussion. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>